Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to the first episode of the Global Thought Leaders podcast which is being prepared by Healy Consultants Group. My name is Mark Liddell, I'm the business website director for the group and I'm also the deputy CEO of our Singapore office. The Global Thought Leaders podcast is one of our initiatives whereby we interview business experts from around the world on various topics related to the global business environment, investment, setting up companies, doing business, entrepreneurship, everything else uh, related to that. Uh, Just to give you a summary, Healy Consultants is a corporate services company headquartered in Singapore. We have offices in Dubai, we have an office in uh, Malaysia and Slovakia in Europe. We have clients all over the world and uh, we we help set up those clients in countries all over the world as well. So we set up companies, we open corporate bank accounts for them and then provide them with a whole range of uh, business setup services. Our guest for today's podcast, and this is our first podcast, is Shirag. Shirag is a partner at VCMV and Associates in uh, Chennai in India. And uh, he's a chartered accountant, and uh, we gather today basically to talk about the recent union budget in India, which was announced a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Chirag has very kindly agreed to speak with us today about some of the key takeaways from that, particularly with regards to foreign investment in India, and some of the challenges and opportunities that foreign investors will face in the new landscape, particularly in the COVID environment in India. Let's just stick with the India Union budget and foreign investment opportunities and everything else. And how's things with you? How, how is Chennai for you today, uh, Chirag? How's life? So all is good. We are back to normal. And then uh, post-pandemic world is really looking good. And uh, we have just picked up on our own. So uh, you know how the demographic and the, uh, the, the dynamics of this country is completely different than the rest of the world. So, uh, but Chennai particularly, yeah, things are back to the normal. We are looking at the same kind of traffic levels, which was pre-COVID-19 level. And uh, business-wise, we are getting a lot more inquiries than ever before. So this year is going to be, what I'm projecting myself is, this year is going to be a buffer year in terms of transactions. Mm. Coupled with the government steps on the reforms and as well as the critical steps taken in terms of resolving some of the business issues. Okay, great. So... uh, yeah, I, I look forward to talking with you about some of this in, in greater detail over the next uh, few minutes, Sir uh, Chirag. Um, obviously, the purpose of our call today is, uh, number one, to to take a little bit of a look at the union budget, which was announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Uh, we're also going to look, obviously, at some of the opportunities for foreign investors in India, some of the challenges, uh, some of the challenges they, they may face. And perhaps, yeah. perhaps to dispel some of the myths about doing business in India, you're based yeah. in Chennai, you, you have a very close uh, uh, knowledge of the country and the way business is done there. And certainly for our international clients, um, uh, getting, a, getting a, an on the ground understanding of, of, of the way business is done in India is really crucial, as you say, in this post-COVID world where India is a land of opportunity. I, 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 think, I think this will be a really valuable discussion and we, we thank you for your time. Same here, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity. Look forward to this discussion. Sure. Um, so thank you for uh, preparing the presentation which you sent to us. Um, and, it, and it's very interesting. And obviously, uh, what I thought I would do to begin with, as as you recommended, is is take a couple of look, uh, a look at a couple of the uh, points on the presentation uh, regarding some of the advantages of India at the moment and uh, one of the dreams of India to, to, to make in India. Uh, a couple of the policies here in the presentation. So what I'll do is I'll skim over those, Chirag, and then that will set the kind of the scene. It will it'll paint the picture for our discussion uh, in a little bit more depth about the budget and about foreign foreign investment opportunities. So um, Advantage India here, you say that since, liberal, since liberalization year, which was 1991, FDI has increased from 75 million US dollars to US dollar 57 billion, uh, yeah. which which is you know obviously a massive jump. Uh, the population of India, and again this is this is this is one of the opportunities of the country. Population of India is expected to rise to 152.2 crores by 2036. Yes. And the estimated youth population will be 77 percent. 
Uh, India is estimated to become the fifth largest consumer country in the world by 2025. It's already the largest supplier of university graduates in the world. And it has the largest, third largest group of scientists and technicians in the world. So these are, these are really, really interesting context points here. Um, very quickly, I'll look at the, the slide that you prepared there on the dream of Make in India. And you talk there about major FDI policy reforms in India in sectors such as defense, infrastructure, pensions, broadcasting, pharmaceuticals, and civil aviation. And you make the point here that foreign investors can invest on their own or as a joint venture, as may be required in certain sectors. And basically, barring just a few sectors, 100% FDI is allowed uh, in, in most sectors. So that's really interesting and something I think that is very much of interest to our multinational clients. Um, yeah. That, that sets the scene. Obviously, uh, against this background, organizations like the World Bank do their annual doing business in India or doing business uh, globally report. And um, the, the, you, you make the point here in your slide, uh, Chirag, that pre-2012, sectors such as financial services, venture capital funds, infrastructure and services sectors required prior approval from the government or the central bank before a foreigner could make an investment. And yeah. nowadays that, that, that situation is very different. Uh, and, and that the, the getting approval is much more, much more straightforward. Um, and in terms of incorporation, again, uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, it would take between two weeks and four weeks to incorporate a company. Uh, and nowadays you're talking about just two working days. So again, significant improvements in that. If you don't mind, if we can, oh, you, you've also mentioned here regulatory um, regulatory changes as well. Pre-2012, there were ineffective regulation channels. Yeah. And uh, then obviously current day, you have insolvency and bankruptcy codes, which again, give give comfort to foreign investors, I'm sure. Uh, do, you, do you have any comments there specifically uh, on some of these changes before we go into into talking about the union budget and specific opportunities for investors, Joe? So uh, I think pretty much we have covered, Mark, just to add a point, uh, as the vision was set in 2014 and the people of this country had given a mandate to the current uh, government uh, that we are, we are looking forward to brighter days and you enabled us to make uh, this a reality. And with the commitment of this current government, though I am I'm balanced, I am not pro-Modi or anti-Modi, sure. but what I have seen as a significant, a significant step here is uh, the competition itself has been that were within the states wherein they they are mandated to uh, uh, put in the mechanism which will ease out the pain of the investors. So earlier, okay, if I could go back to 2014, if an investor is going to come to India, he's aware about the central legislations, which is incorporation of the company and the labor uh, the labor social security taxes, right? But apart from that, there was absolutely no clarity on what should I do with the state regulation. So if a company is going to in invest in Tamil Nadu, they were Left at the apathy of the bureaucrats who will just let, make the investors room door to door and it was it was so annoying right and that has spoiled india's image what this government has smartly done is they have leveraged more on a te technology and one of the sustainable development goals they have put as the business reform action plan and they have made absolutely necessary for all 28 states of india to implement this plan and every year this has been planned. So every each and every state, uh, state has to go through a parameter check and they have they have to be ranked based on those parameters. And that has actually helped in improving the ease of doing business in India. And that's that's the reflection of World Bank ranking, where in India was at one forty uh, second rank uh, in the year 2014, and currently it is at 63rd rank. Yeah. And going moving forward. Moving forward, there are a lot of work in progress. So the, the government is cognizant of the fact of uh, the arbitration issues, the commercial dispute issues, the uh, labor reform issues. So all the work is already in progress. And you will see a lot of positive changes happening pro-business in the coming years. Mm. Thank you for that, uh, Chirag. Um, 
moving forward now, uh, you know, against this 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 background, um, moving into the the specifics of the union budget, which was announced a couple of weeks ago for 2021, um, and specifically, you know, uh, as 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 our focus area is foreign investment and what's in it for multinational clients. Um, what would you say initially were some of the takeaway items uh, from the union budget from your perspective, Chirag, and obviously in the context of global investment? So, uh, Mark, really, if you would have observed the India uh, during the pandemic world, we actually had five budgets. It was not only one budget. And government was on real-time basis addressing the issues of the industry. So if I have to put together from the scenario of 2019 till 2021, there have been a lot of steps which the government has already taken, reducing the tax levels for the manufacturing sector from 20, 30% to 15% is one of the significant changes, and which is one of the lowest across the globe, right? Uh, for the size of the India's country and taking a hit of the physical deficit, it's kind of a bold step. Mm. And uh, see, we are we are already the uh, you can call us as a global pharmacy of the world and global technology. Uh, hub of the world today, right? The TCS by market cap has also already exceeded, uh, exceeded Accenture. So it has become, a TCS has become number one in the globe in terms of services company and technology company. And from the pharmaceutical perspective, we're already following the news of the vaccine uh, production, massive vaccine production, which India is doing and supplying to the supplying to the globe already, right? So these are the se uh, sectors which are already settled. But now the focus is on the sectors which needs government's attention. So I will say the textiles, defense, and fintech, and uh, more importantly, the infrastructure. So because government believes that once you have a proper infrastructure in place, the things will fall in place. And therefore, in this budget, the government has already allocated, and it has been doing, it has already allocated a huge amount of capital in terms of the commitment is there. We have to just wait and watch how this is going to be fulfilled, but, uh, I observe the thrust is there. So one of the significant change uh, which we can see is the textiles, mm. where the government has announced uh, seven textile parks, which will be kind of a plug and play facilities, and it is going to be at the global standards, right? Mm. And this this step has been taken in uh, in terms of the rising competition from the neighboring countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Turkey, and China. Right. And uh, further, the domestic units are not upgraded technologically and they have an inefficient infrastructure. In this regard, the government has already taken this first step to uh, put up a proper infrastructure in place and also give the fiscal incentives here, which I've already highlighted in the presentation. One is the corporate tax rate is brought down to 17.16 percent, which is globally a lowest rate. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, there are incentives to generate employment in India, which is if you spend a dollar in India, you, have, you can get a tax expense reduction of 1.9 US dollars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, exports are absolutely tax free. There are duty exemptions and deferral on import of capital goods for the purpose of manufacturing and one of the lowest repatriation tax. So this was a significant step which was taken in the last budget in terms of dividend taxation. So profits accumulated in India, if you have to distribute back to the shareholders, dividend and buyback was the only route. So dividend will most often be used. Mm -hmm. And if you come from some specific jurisdictions to India, you can cut your dividend tax rate to as low as 5%. So right. uh, th these are the opportunities which I'm trying to open up for the uh, uh, for the uh, benefit of all of us, right? So uh, there is a myth. There is a myth, as you rightly pointed out at the start of this session. There is a myth that India is not a business-friendly destination. That used to be the past, but not anymore. Mm. Uh, uh, you, you talk there about all 28 states. I think you mentioned uh, Shirag being sort of uh, buying into this 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 idea. Uh, are there any specific states in India which which are more proactive, more uh, open, and more welcoming for foreign investors? Uh, you know, do, do you feel that some states are better equipped for foreign to attract foreign investment? Uh, oh, yes, yes. yes. Absolutely. So if you uh, follow the state wise, every state is today running a show called invest in the respective states. For example, I'll talk about Tamil Nadu. So Tamil Nadu has already put up a, uh, a Tamil Nadu invest website and where you can just go, press a button and do a single window application. Yeah. And the authorities will help you to get all the requisite registrations and clicks. And not only that, it does not stop with that. If you have any grievance as a foreign investor, there is a business body uh, which has been uh, allocated by your bureaucrats. You have to register your grievance there, and within seven days, there is a mandate by the government that it has to be resolved. 
I'll give you one practical instance. One of our MNC clients was stuck with the bureaucrat in terms of laying out the infrastructure which was committed by the government. But then when the government got into it, within seven days, the infrastructure was ready. And there's a practical instance which the client has shared with us. And now this is going to get give a positive signal. And although this this MNC has already got its OAM suppliers into India. Mm. So the, the, the image of India in terms of not only India, the image of the states are changing. Like you're calling the Uttar Pradesh, right? Mm. Uttar Pradesh, as such, the investment climate, the Microsoft and the other companies already committed to invest in Uttar Pradesh. Mm. Telangana Telangana has already invited applications from uh, uh, the Apple and Microsoft and the Amazon has already committed 20,000 crores in terms of the investment and this is just a beginning. So already the states have already implemented these kind of measures which government wanted it to be done at a federal level. We've talked here about the ease of doing business and the challenges of doing business in India, but what about the costs of doing business, Shirag? I mean, India, again, has a reputation for being a pretty low cost uh, country to, in which to do business. Would you say that is true? And would you say that foreign investors, uh, India is cost competitive compared to other, other areas? Well, absolutely. Uh, so uh, our closest competition is China. So now what I'm hearing and what I'm practically seeing with our clients is they're moving their basis from manufacturing in terms of from China and relocating to Vietnam, Indonesia and India for the cost reasons, right? Mm -hmm. The labor cost in China has gone up by 5x, right? Yeah. But in India, if it was a USD $5 per hour in China, it's USD $1 per hour in India still. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that is a uh, significant cost in terms of manufacturing sectors and also the technology sectors, right? So uh, apart from that, the location uh, savings, right? The, uh, the infrastructure costs and the rental costs are, are highly competitive in terms of the other developing nations. So there are dedicated zones and you enter into a long-term lease with the government and insignificant amount is being collected as rentals from these manufacturing zones. So there are a lot of these special economic zones already available in India, which has been earmarked for the manufacturing purposes. Okay. Um, and in terms of the legal system in India, it's based on English common law. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. That's okay. absolutely right. And government is already in, uh, has taken steps to reform certain uh, uh, certain laws, which are uh, which is kind of inherited from uh, uh, pre-independence uh, uh, system. So I think most of the reforms have already been introduced. What we are going to see in the next two years is the judicial reforms, right? Government is cognizant about the litigations, the pending litigations, the piling of litigations with the courts in India. And uh, the, it has already uh, introduced in the recent budget speech of introducing e-courts and uh, faceless uh, uh, proceedings in terms of tribunals, the tax tribunals, right? So, and also government is working on putting up a proper conciliation mechanism so that it can give a comfort to the foreign investors. So any contracts with the government authorities or any 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 disputes there, you can just use the conciliation mechanism in order to resolve your dispute instead of going through the court process, which takes uh, more than a decade to resolve. Mm, sure. So those, those are the some of the work in progress, and I would say, I would say that I'm hopeful that in the next two three years those uh, those should be addressed. Yeah, I mean, uh, going back to what you said a couple of minutes ago, Shirag, about um, uh, you, you were noticing a, a shift of manufacturers from China to India, uh, India being far more cost competitive these days. Um, what, one of the one of the observations that is, you know, China and India um, are, are very often um, compared in, in many respects, but um, I think it's fair to say historically Chinese infrastructure has been developed much more quickly and, and more efficiently than in India. I, it's interesting to note um, what you said a few minutes ago about very much a focus on infrastructure development in India. Um, how quickly do you think India, you know, the infrastructure in India will, will uh, be developed up to scratch? Uh, so, Mark, we need to be cognizant about the difference in the governance structure, right? Uh, China follows a communist mechanism of governing and the India follows a democratic uh, method of uh, uh, following the, running the government, right? Sure. And it's a cooperative federalism. So, while the intent has been made, while well, the steps have been taken, we'll have to wait and watch how this... So, already out of 7,000, 6,000 uh, odd projects which the government had already started with the infrastructure pipeline, 217 projects have been completed. So, uh, the development is happening. And the pace of development is much, much faster compared to the last decade.
So, and the government is making a fair usage of technology in terms of constructing an infrastructure. And the trust is going to be tier two, tier three cities. They've already earmarked some of the corridors. They have identified that some of the corridors and those corridors will be developed for the purposes of the businesses. Mm -hmm. So in terms of getting directly to your question, uh, what is the duration of uh, this infrastructure development? It is going to be a long term. Uh, but the first step, which is required to be taken, has already been taken. Yeah, sure. There's a strong resolve within the government to do this. Yeah. Um, in India, correct me if I'm wrong, Shirak, has has a network of special economic zones. Is that correct? Sort of eff effectively free zones. Is that right? Yes. And 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 how how important a part have they played in attracting foreign investment? And what role do you see for them going forward? Well, it used to be because uh, all these benefits have been taken away by March 2020. Uh, so uh, that's that's the shift we are looking at, right? So any companies coming to India post 2020 uh, are anyway under the lowest tax. So even within the special economic zone, what was happening was companies were still paying effective tax of 20 percent, 18 to 20 percent. Mm. So government said with incentives, if you're going to pay, if you're OK to pay 18, 20 percent, let me cut down the rate to 15 percent and face off all the incentives from the tax perspective. So uh, the, those have been on. What is attracting now the global investors is the uh, there are three, four positives, right? One is the lowest cost of doing business in India in terms of the labor and the infrastructure cost. Two, the tax incentives. Three, the customized uh, package with the respective state governments offer. So uh, the, the soft loans, right? So uh, you you approach the local state government and you say, okay, I'm going to create this amount of employment within your state. I'm going to develop your backward area, and they customize an incentive package for you and you make a use of it, use of that. And apart from that, what government has done recently is it has introduced a production le linked incentive scheme. So which means uh, based on the terms and conditions which has to be freezed, you will be eligible for four to six percent of your investment year on year as a subsidy. And that's going to be a cash subsidy altogether. So it's a huge, huge uh, uh, move, move is the government has made. It's kind of uh, putting up a red carpet and inviting the investors into India. A couple more questions. Uh, th there is a proposal in the budget to increase uh, caps on foreign direct investment in certain sectors like insurance. Is, yeah. Tell me about whether that's a, a smart move. Absolutely, because uh, India is a country uh, in terms of uh, the pandemic uh, scenario, right? So pandemic and also the deposit insurance. The One of the issues which India has faced in the last two, three years is uh, unraveling uh, stressed assets within the banking segment, which has right. led to the closure of youth of banks. And what was happening is the depositors were not getting their new money. And that has been addressed to in introducing a deposit insurance scheme. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, uh, one of the, so this government has 17 sustainable development goals, and one of the goals is the health well-being, and that cannot be done without the insurance. In order to invite the global investors to in, invest in India, obviously they will not come with 49% as stake. They would like to take a majority stake into India, and therefore uh, raising from 49% to 74% is one of the smartest moves. Uh, that will increase a lot of investors to invest in India. Okay, very good. I don't think I have any other questions, actually. I think we'll keep this short and sweet, Shirag. Um, I, I think we, we've given a nice overview, uh, and this is the first in a series of discussions perhaps you and I will have, and, and obviously we'll be speaking to other experts around the world uh, about their own countries. But I, I think for now this gives a, a really interesting overview of, of uh, India, and uh, we, we've dispelled some myths um, we, we've talked about some of the opportunities, which I think will be very interesting for our, our multinational clients and our audience. So I appreciate your time, Chirag. Same here, Mark. Nice talking to you. Look forward. OK, thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. So we hope you enjoy the podcast and uh, happy listening.